Hi everyone, thanks for thanks for joining us today. I'm Marie McBain with G2 and I'm here with my, my colleague Sean Saint. I'm gonna start by sharing a little bit about why we're here and why we care about user reviews so much at G2. And then Sean will share some hopefully really good, meaningful, tactical tools that you can take away to affect your own business. So first I'm gonna dig into some data from the Edelman Trust barometer and for those of you who aren't familiar the Edelman Trust Barometer is a study that is published every year that digs into consumers relationships with trust as a concept as their as their buyers in the world and there was one stat in particular that really struck us in this year's report which is that a good reputation may get you to try a product but without trust in that company behind the product it's not going to be retained. Um, so two thirds of respondents to the survey agreed with this statement. And so Sean and I actually got into thinking a little bit about what that means. What's, what's reputation versus trust? And there's an expression that I really love that I believe I first heard from Mike Gamson at, at our kickoff last year um, when talking about kindness and compassion, that compassion is kindness plus action. So when I was thinking about this reputation versus trust concept, it felt very similar. So for me, you know, reputation is, is what's expected of you, but trust is reputation plus action. So it's the expectation plus the follow through. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Um, I think that the barrier to actually trying a product is a lot lower than if you try it and you don't get what you were led to believe that you would get from the product. If you don't have trust with that company, of course you're gonna move on. So as we thought further about trust, there was an additional um, element in this study um, about when hearing from a company, how credible is the information if it's from various sources? I do want to call out this study was cross industry, so this is not limited to just technology, uh, but the most trusted sources at companies were technical experts, academic experts, which I think is where you see that, that other industry show up, and then a person like you. So the third most trusted potential source and, and a pretty close third there uh, is people are really trying to hear from people like themselves. Uh, they really, you know, they're going to trust people who are going to have experiences similar to what they might expect for themselves. So we're going to dig in a little bit further to how you can present that information to potential buyers. And that's really all that G2 is here to do. So um, G2 was really founded to help democratize the buying journey within technology, um, because we've seen this journey over the last, what, 20 years that consumers have become a lot more informed because various industries have gotten a lot more democratized. Consumers are able to hear from each other. They're able to hear from other users, other consumers like themselves. Uh, I'm, I'm betting that just about everyone on the line has had experiences similar to me when it comes to shopping for a consumer good, you know, checking out Checking out reviews on Amazon, I literally did that yesterday, shopping for a present. My last vacation, and I was all over TripAdvisor, and as a matter of fact, this morning for my next business trip, um, reading hotel reviews. Before I accepted my position at G2, I was all over Glassdoor making sure that I knew what I was going to be signing on for, and even down to planning uh, you know, a dinner out with friends going to Yelp rather than previously Yellow Pages. So it's that shift from information that's controlled by the company, controlled by sort of a you know behind closed doors element, to opening it up so that you're able to get information from people like yourselves. So we wanted to bring that same concept into B2B software buying, where previously, historically, you know, you would be leaning on on your gardeners of the world where there's a traditional analyst, where there's some sort of black box analysis handing or handling of information to really being able to bring transparency to the industry. So tying to that, one of our one of our key I guess 
key foundational tenets at G2 is that buyers come first. So what we're doing is gathering unbiased data from real users. We have transparent, guideline, transparent research guidelines. And then my role at the company, I know we breezed through those introductions, but um, I'm the VP of research operations here. And the research team at G2 is tasked with really gathering all of that unbiased data. So we, we both gather the user reviews and organize them, and then also take all of that data and turn it into information by generating reports, by providing scoring algorithms that can take all of those hundreds of data points that are out there in a given product category or on a given product and turning it into information that's useful for a buyer. And then I have with me Sean, uh, Sean Saint from our partnerships team, if you wanna share a little bit about the perspective you bring. Yeah, thank you, Marie, and thank you, Christina, for having me. Um, coincidentally, I actually started my career off at Qualtrics, which was an insight portfolio company. So excited to be here um, with everyone here. And um, you know, my role at G2 is, is very broad, but it you know spans a lot of work um, with Insight and um, with Christina to help kind of disseminate the interesting work that um, G2 is doing to elevate the voice of an entrepreneur on G2.com. I mean. Our, at our core, as, as Marie mentioned, we're helping to democratize um, B2B purchasing decisions, and we've done that for the last seven years, where day in, day out, Marie's team is sourcing reviews, moderating reviews, managing reviews, and ultimately making a very interesting free resource for buyers and sellers to connect. Um, so to date, just to give you a little bit of context about kind of the scale that we've reached, over 4 million unique buyers are visiting G2 every single month to shop for software. Um, and read those 1 million plus reviews across 100,000 products. So as Marie mentioned, and as you on the phone can probably, um, can probably gather, we sit on this treasure trove of data that's really interesting, that fundamentally helps the folks today understand what buyers care about, what buyers are doing on G2, what sort of information is most relevant to them. And the purpose of this, this webinar is really to give you those um, some of those research guidelines and then ultimately give you those tactical examples um, of what you can do literally after this webinar um, to resonate with your buyers more. So really excited to be here and to, to connect with you all. So from there, uh, we're going to move into as we, you know, at G2, we gather all of these great reviews that are at the product level, but we also wanted to be able to zoom out and understand, well, what are the general themes? What are the overall trends that we're seeing in software buying? So we performed a study to dig into just that a little bit earlier this year, or goodness, it's 2020. <laughs> um, in 2019, last year, uh, we, we performed a buyer behavior study. We surveyed close to 1,400 respondents at a range of company sizes. So we really wanted to get a full representation uh, covering SMBs, mid-market, as well as the enterprise to understand what's different and what's similar uh, between these buyers. We also covered a wide range of revenue generation because, again, we wanted to have that full representation. And for me, the, the most striking statistic from it was when we looked at this particular question. So we asked how strongly respondents agreed with the statement, we usually engage a sales professional only when we have made a purchase decision. Uh, so there were interesting dynamics with differences regionally here, but the lowest we saw was 44% of respondents in North America agreed or strongly agreed with this statement. It was more extreme in EMEA and APAC where it was 58 to 61% who were saying, again, they don't talk to a sales professional until they've already made up their mind about what they want to buy. So what this tells us is that you really need to th think differently about your sales process. Uh, because if they're not talking to your sales reps, well, where are they getting information? So the good news is, even though they may not be talking to your sales reps, they're still very much researching your company on your website. So it was one of the number one sources. Next up were peers and colleagues and public product review websites, which I think speak directly to that, um, to that trust element from, from the Edelman survey, from the Edelman study, that they're trying to understand, well, what's the experience of another user like me? Uh, vendor salespeople do come into play after that. Uh, and then 
at just 31% are those traditional market research firms and analysts, which I think speaks to that desire from buyers to be able to, to seek out that democratized information rather than relying on the black box. Um, then we have professional organizations, public social networks, and internal supplier portals. And Maria, I'm, you know, when, when looking at this information, I, I was very surprised to see that sales, the vendor salesperson was kind of like dramatically higher than the market research firms or analysts, right? Like a salesperson's job is to sell their software and they're inherently biased. Mm -hmm. Whereas you'd imagine that a market research firm would not have like a necessarily a dog in the fight. Mm -hmm. Do you, do you have any insight into like why people get information from salespeople more often? I think there's a combination of things. Those, those traditional research firms can be very expensive as resources for buyers. So I think there's a level of access and a level of trust that's going on um, because people have gotten familiar with how those, how those analyst firms can work. Um, and I think there is suspicion that there could be pay to play aspects, um, which hopefully there aren't, but, um, but I do think there's that level of trust that, that is lacking. Got it. No. So then from there, I think the next really obvious question is, well, when they're going to these resources, what's the information that they're looking for? And this is where I think there's some really helpful stuff that, that Sean will share that you can take to do today, like after this call. Um, so number one, the most valuable information on those resources, pricing information. I think this goes back to that, that transparency. There's clear hunger for, for pricing detail, pricing transparency out there. There's actually a really interesting um, Twitter thread by, was it Peter Austin Smith, I believe? We'll, we'll get there. Um, yeah, uh, but a really interesting thread with lots of fun facts about, uh, or fun interesting facts about how software is priced and you know things you might not know. Um, so clear interest there. Next up, comparison ratings of products or services based on review data. So again, consistent with that, seeking out reviews. Uh, ability to filter reviews by industry and reviewer job title. That again, speaks back to the concept of getting information from people like yourself. So this is something that, that we do on G2 that we've actually expanded in the last year to be able to filter by industry, by job title, by company segment. So to, to understand, is this somebody in another small business? Is, it, is this somebody in the enterprise space? And then even adding on regional to understand, well, I would like to hear from other users in, in the US or in Asia, in India. Um, and I think, I think this ties back to like the TripAdvisor example, Marie, where a five-star review of a hotel is dramatically different if you have a, a wife and kids, you know, or a partner mm -hmm. and kids, compared to if you're gonna have a bachelor party in Las Vegas, yes. right? Like there is context in a thumbs up, thumbs down style or, you know, just star rating style doesn't get you all of the data, all the insights you need. Yeah, absolutely. Um, transparent validation of review and reviewer, again, helps drive that trust. So do I know where this review came from? Do I believe this is a real user, a real consumer? Uh, there have certainly been scandals out there about people buying fake reviews and Consumers are aware of that and want to make sure that they're reading real content. Review source, I believe, speaks to that same desire from buyers. Then we have comparison of key features. So that next level, not just comparing star ratings, but comparing specific aspects of what you're going to buy. They're looking for balance. So both positive and negative comments. And then finally, recency. So they care about making sure that the review is relevant. Um, though honestly, I was a little surprised to see this so low on the list. Recency? Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, personally, when I'm looking, especially in SaaS, when I'm looking at reviews, there's so many iterations to a tool. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of you know SaaS vendors pride themselves on is the constant innovation. So I'd agree. I personally filter based off of most recent reviews. Yeah. Um, so from there, like I said, we want to take this what, what I find, I'm, I'm kind of the, the egghead between the two of us here, um, but where we find this information really interesting, also wanted to turn it into, well, what are some things that we can do with it? So Sean. Yeah, so all of the examples of, of kind of best practices that we've seen are coming from the folks in the Insight Port Co. Um, it's pretty easy because you guys are a, um, an amazing group that you know are very innovative. 
Uh, so campaign monitor, for example, is, is kind of top of the list when it comes to, well, if, if people are using vendor websites the most to find information, and of that, the most important information is, is pricing, um, I think Campaign Monitor does an amazing job of clearly, succinctly showing what that price looks like. Uh, from the research that we found, about 80% of SaaS vendors do not prominently showcase pricing. So first of all, there's a clear opportunity to get out in front of that and showcase that transparency. And second of all, I do want to highlight how clear this is. Um, I've been on a number of vendor calls where at the end you get to the pricing slide and after some like pushback of even seeing the slide in the first place, the pricing is so complicated. And I can't take that up the chain um, or disseminate that to my decision makers uh, about what tool or you know what feature or, or what plan we want. So Campaign Monitor does a great job of prominently displaying pricing right front and center and, and showcasing that transparency. Yeah, as somebody who's been on the buying end of software myself, I think that this really speaks to that that trust element as well. Because, you know, when you're when you're making a big purchase decision, I mean, it's natural to experience fear that you're you're not getting a good deal that somebody's taking you right. And when there's this good, clear, transparent pricing, that takes that fear away because you know that everybody's getting priced the same. You know you're getting a fair deal. Mm -hmm. So I think that's great. So I hope some folks from Campaign Monitor are on, are on the line. If not, obviously this is recorded and we can, we can share it with them. In addition, I mean, something else that Marie was mentioning is just highlighting customer voice, highlighting reviews. And review sites like G2 or, or elsewhere um, essentially are this like organic machine for you to, for you to get uh, transparent kind of case studies, right? For you to get transparent customer testimonials. And if they're already on sites like G2, the low hanging fruit here is just simply bringing them into your own ecosystem. So we love what, again, another port co Hootsuite's doing um, to showcase this sort of information. And then the one nuance that I just wanna bring up here is while they chose these three reviews here that are you know, very favorable, you actually have the optionality to read all Hootsuite reviews on G2. Right, so this is something that we think is a best practice, again, showcasing transparency and understanding that we don't need just five-star reviews to ultimately be turned on to a product. We actually see the, the most highest converting um, reviews to be between 4.2 and 4.7 stars uh, because there is that sort of um, constructive criticism that goes in to ultimately lead someone down a pur purchasing path. Nothing's perfect in showcasing the opportunities to improve um, is, is crucial to actually conversion. And while reviews themselves are really interesting, um, and as we kind of alluded to, uh, G2 does not have this kind of thumbs up, thumbs down, emoji style of review. Uh, you know, I actually think about what the research team is doing is more mini case studies. They're sourcing mini case studies um, and collecting a ton of data about a reviewer. And this information actually can be um, displayed in really interesting ways. So Chargebee, I think, may do the, the best out of any sort of G2 customer um, on the site, having leveraging this rich data G2 collects um, and showcasing this to their buyers. So for this example, um, Chargebee is showing a specific comparison to one of their competitors here. Uh, G2 collects data as specific as payback period in months. What you can see here is that with Chargebee, the average expected ROI is six months compared to 23, which was one of their competitors' um, metrics. So again, it's not just the thumbs up, thumbs down, but it's getting really granular into some of the key, um, the key insights that the buyers want. Uh, yeah, I was out, um, if I can add, because what I love here is that Chargebee is using some of those deeper metrics and when you're reading a review site versus leaving a review, there's always a difference between the depth of the review versus what that summary that's that's automatically displayed on the site is. And so I would encourage you on G2, on any review site, to leave a review and read what's out there because um, there's going to be additional data you might be able to dig into. So like here, for example, um, that ROI, some of the other pricing related metrics that we gather and that we do publish in reports, but may not be out there. So make sure you're really digging in and leveraging all of the data that makes sense for you. Mm -hmm. And it also spans across different stakeholders internally. 
right? So for example, uh, as you can see here on, on the bottom, we actually have insight into quality of support, which you know a CSM manager um, would care about or even a CEO, but there's also other questions that are proxies for product, right? So both someone internally, in a, you know, like the, the product, Chargebee's product C, CPO would care about product related questions, but other folks internally would also care about these kind of quality of support questions. So I guess the takeaway there is it's not just for external, it's not just for your potential buyers, but these reviews can also be used internally across different um, departments within the organization. And so you know, we're not expecting people to you know, come off this webinar and say, you know what, we're gonna build this amazing report, we're gonna spend a ton of resources to build this, um, you know, we would love you know, we'd love for this to, to happen, but we did want to provide you some examples of literally right after this, this webinar, what you can do um, to resonate with your buyers. Uh, so, you know, one example here, again, PlanView is a, um, a part of the Insight Network. Uh, what PlanView did here and the call out here is on every single listing on G2, we have over 100,000 products. It's a completely, first of all, it's completely free to sign up onto, onto G2. Um, and, and list your product here. So if you are not already, um, it's very intuitive to, to do so. But on every single profile here, we include pricing. And to Marie's point, we include pricing because that's the information buyers care about. Similar to that stat of 80% of software companies not actually including pricing on their website, roughly the same, I don't know the specifics, but roughly the same is on g2.com. So this is, again, a really, this is low hanging fruit as to how you can resonate with your buyers more by claiming your profile on G2, adding pricing directly onto your page and doing so completely for free. About 4 million buyers every single month come to G2. So you will see traction. You will see um, a response when you have this sort of information here. And, you know, beyond showcasing pricing, something else that we always recommend folks do um, whether it be on G2 or whether it be on other sites is to Marie's point about taking action, right? How can we take action on these reviews? And when someone, a customer of yours takes the time to leave a review, there's this, this is a great opportunity for you to work with them and interact with them directly and showcase that um, the kind of the person behind the brand, right? And across kind of the thousands of companies that we work with very closely on G2, I think Talent LMS does one of the best jobs um, that I've ever seen um, responding to every single review. So Talent LMS has a number of awesome reviews on G2 and literally every single one has gotten a very thoughtful response. So this is what a standard review form looks like on G2. The call out here is that they're long form and they're also very structured. I mentioned what do you dislike is something that's really important to buyers. And in here, there's some constructive criticism uh, for Talent LMS. Well, Fani from Talent LMS actually took the time to respond to this, which we showcase loud and proud on G2.com, and actually says specifically solutions that the reviewer can have um, to solve their problems. So for me, this is something that um, I always look to when I'm looking at reviews to see if folks are taking action on that, again, to bring that trust. So hope the Talent LMS team is on, on the line um, because Fani did an amazing job of, of showcasing um, that action and being really thoughtful. So like Shauna said, we wanted to, to make sure there were clear takeaways, but um, to pull that back up to the big picture, not just those those tactical things. So claiming claiming your page on G2 and, and listing pricing, repl replying to reviews, listing pricing on your own website. Uh, but we wanted to pull back out and connect that to the themes that we've seen in our research and in the trust study. So I'd say the biggest headline for me is that you can't rely on that traditional sales process, which is why all of those additional steps are so important because people are gonna make decisions before you're able to control the conversation. So you need to make sure that you are seeding good information into, the com into that conversation, regardless of where they're looking. You need to review your reviews and your competitors' reviews. So not just, um, not just reading the feedback from your own customers and replying to it, um, 
but also making sure that you understand how the market is reacting to changes in your competitors' products. So compare yourself. You know that that's what, what buyers are doing, so look at those comparisons yourself. You wanna have that robust feedback cycle. So back to that concept of, of reputation versus trust, where again, if trust is reputation plus action, the feedback cycle needs to include action. So ask for that feedback and then do something with it. And then last but not least, again, that, that trust is everything. So you have to understand them, you have to build trust with your buyer. So it's not just about getting them in the door and establishing trust on those review sites, but then once they're in your, in your customer set, make sure that you're continuing to follow through with them so that you know, they, they understand your reputation coming in as a customer, they build trust with you, they renew with you and then hopefully become one of those advocates for you out there leaving positive reviews themselves. So with that, thank you so much for having us. Um, I believe Christina will hand the mic back to you now and uh, take questions. Wonderful, thank you so much both. This was really informative. And for anyone listening, please feel free to type in some of your questions now in the control panel. We do have some that already came in. Um, and a great one to start. So how do I encourage people to give reviews? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And that's something that I think at first seems really daunting, right? Like these are my customers, they're paying me money. The last thing I want is for them to be spending, like to be annoying them or, or having you know, review fatigue, so to speak, is something that we, we think about a lot. Um, one of the, the takeaways I, I would say is Think about the compelling events or the meaningful events in a customer life cycle. Uh, you know, they first purchase and then they implement and then you have the QBRs um, and then ideally they renew. So there's optimal times in that customer life cycle to capture a review. So one example of that would be after they implement, right? Typically after an implementation, a lot of times there will be an NPS survey um, to make sure that the quality of support was high. Um, after that, after that happens, that is a great time to simply leave a review. So, you know, think about how you work with your customers in that life cycle and then activate around those sort of compelling events. Um, second of all, a, a more passive way is simply to have your, um, have a review ask in your, um, in your signature. So if you have a team or you run a team of kind of customer success folks in, in their signature, it's a gr best practice to include you know, have a, had a great experience, leave a review. Um, we actually have an integration with Sigster, uh, which just got acquired by Terminus to make this process really, really easy. So those are some quick uh, kind of ways to, to gather reviews. I'd say the final example is if you are having customer events, whether it be a small customer meetup, whether it be a large kind of annual um, event, set up a time to have folks leave reviews there, right? Like at, as tactical as during the happy hour, set up a booth and people love to leave reviews with a beer in hand. Um, I've seen it firsthand. So those are some examples of, of ways you can, um, ways you can get that steady stream, stream of reviews going. Um, I would say that 10 is typically that magic number internally, at least when we think about um, driving trust and, and ultimately driving conversion. Yeah, um, within G2, we do, we do encourage companies to drive at least 10 reviews. And actually when you sign up with G2, we will help people get some of those initial reviews ourselves. Um, we we wanna make sure that we have data integrity behind all of our scores so we don't actually include uh, any products in grids, in reports until they have at least 10 reviews. Uh, so I think that, that's a really great threshold to shoot for. And then of course, when people sign up with G2, we have additional tools. Uh, and services that we can provide to help with that. Again, that steady stream of reviews that I think helps maintain um, helps maintain that visibility uh, when new new potential buyers are reviewing reviewing your reputation on review sites, so that they can see that it's consistent across time, not just you know a, a, a huge a huge onslaught of reviews. That it's it's truly something that you're supporting continuously. Awesome, thank you. Love the idea of doing it at an event. Um, another question, um, 
What are some ways to negate negative reviews? Great question, Christina. I mean, I, or not Christina, thank you for, for bringing the question up, but whoever asked it, thank you. Um, so I would say like, I wanna separate out negative reviews from, from like bad reviews. Bad review, I would say is an inauthentic review, which G2 works day in, day out to eliminate. Um, if you wanna like classify a negative review, first of all, we actually see that reviews between 4.2 and 4.7 convert higher than the perfect review. So you're always it's honestly fine to have something with a little bit of constructive criticism. And then to the talent LMS example, responding to that review, you know, empathizing with the pain, and then also bringing in product to understand that, hey, this is what a real customer had to say. And let's think about how we can take action and solve that bug, solve that problem um, that they had. Yeah, I think if you put yourself in the in the reviewer's shoes or think about yourself as a consumer, we've all had bad experiences, right? And we can remember times when, well, it stayed a bad experience, and then times where the the provider, the you know, the the store, the the vendor engaged with us and made that experience right and completely turned it around. So I think review or responding to reviews is a really important way to engage with those negative reviews. And then on G2, we also invite reviewers to update the reviews in case their experience has changed. So you do have that opportunity to, opportunity to, to turn it around and actually change the results. That's great, thank you. Another question, um, how are you different than Trust Radius or Thumbtack? That's a very good question. So, I mean, when I, from a scale perspective, I think that's like the, the number one thing you wanna think about. Um, there's a number of different organizations out there that are similar to, to G2 that solicit reviews, um, but you're not gonna wanna have 20% of your investment in every single one because you're gonna end up not being great on, on any of them. Um, we have the most traffic, we have the most buyers coming to G2, we have the most data, the highest quality reviews coming through. Um, so kind of when, when thinking about trust radius, that's typically how we, um, how we wanna compare ourselves. Um, and then like going back to the, the idea of G2, it's really to connect those buyers and sellers. For our perspective, like as long as the reviews are validated and verified, we don't have a dog in the fight. You know, frankly, like a, a constructive review is, is really helpful for buyers. Um, so there, there, it is a very much like democratizing this sort of um, access to, to reviews. And um, for the individual asking, we can share a little bit more um, specific examples of, of how we're different with, from Trust Radius. Um, Maria and I are kind of adjacent to the sales team, so we don't go into those kind of head to head conversations, but happy to provide a little bit more information after the conversation. Yeah, and I, I think where where I'd layer on just a little bit is I know that we approach the the research aspects of of our presence a little bit differently from from your trust radius. Uh, so we have a really robust research team that is staffed with making sure that all of again all of those reviews are high quality, that we have the site organized appropriately, that we are we are um, evaluating reviews to make sure that they are attributed appropriately. So if, if we have a given product that bridges several categories, we're actually working really hard to make sure that reviews are only brought into consideration in the appropriate category. So if, um, if a user is only using it for one of those things, the review will only go there. So we go into a lot of detail to make sure that we have really clean data uh, and then try to be really transparent with our scoring as well. Yeah, Marie's underselling that aspect. She works and has a great team that focuses like a long time, day in, day out on, on kind of structuring that sort of information. And then on the thumbtack side, um, G2 specifically, just 99% of the reviews are, are in SaaS. It's all B2B. Um, 1% are B2B services, but you know, the remaining 99% are B2B SaaS um, reviews, which uh, thumbtack is, is a little bit different in, in that space. Really helpful. Um, thank you so much both. So those were the questions that we had for now. If anyone del does still have a question, feel free to enter it now. I'll give you 20 seconds and I'll speak very slowly so you can do that. Um, otherwise, thank you so much, Marie and Sean. This has been really informative. Um, and for all the listeners today, we will be posting the recording 
Um, so feel free to give that a listen or watch later and share it with your colleagues and also explore more about G2 on their vendor listing on Go if you're an Insight portfolio company. Um, but that's it for now. Thank you both and everyone have a great day. Thanks so much. Have a good day.